own school of medicine to become a physician. He often signs documents with Y at sign because it's canonically everybody, my name is Wyatt Schaefer and I'm a biochemistry student here at UT Tyler. Um, a little note about this paper is it is brimming with chemistry, math, and coffee. However, due to the nature of this presentation, I'm going to be emphasizing the chemistry. So if you are a math person or a coffee person in this room, I exhort you to ask those questions at the end. But without further ado, let us jump into systematically improving espresso, insights from mathematical modeling and experiment. What is espresso? Espresso is when we take finely ground coffee and we pack it into a cylindrical bed and then we brew hot water around 200 degrees Fahrenheit through that coffee bed such that the resulting espresso beverage is 25 to 35 milliliters in volume and takes about 30 seconds. As I'm sure you're very aware, that's a lot of variables and for this reason, this is uh, easily the most um, subject to variability in all of the coffee brewing methods. Things like water temperature, grind size, even the levelness of your coffee bed contribute to the quality of your espresso shot. <clears throat> in this paper, we're going to be targeting something called extraction yield, which is the percent of solvated mass of your coffee divided by the initial starting mass of coffee. This is going to be a description of how efficiently we are using our coffee. Sometimes uh, in industry or in the literature, you'll hear, hear people talk about beverage strength, but this is... Uh, <clears throat> This does not tell us anything about how efficiently we're using our coffee. And for this reason, we will digress from that point. Um, you can see here that we have our espresso bed, or our coffee bed. These large gray circles, circles are our boulders. Um, those are what you typically think of as your coffee grain. And then you have these small dark gray circles, and these are our fines. And they're produced as a result of the fracturing and chipping process when you grind coffee. They are microscopic in nature, and so I can almost guarantee you've never seen them. Uh, I mean, these are just some fun coffee structures that, or some fun structures that tend to be in coffee. So let's develop a rational model for this. First, we need to describe the movement of coffee solubles from inside the coffee grain right up to that coffee grain water interface. Then we need to describe the transport of solubles from inside the coffee into the water. And then thirdly, we need to describe the diffusion and advection of those coffee solubles in the liquid immediately surrounding the coffee grain. Now, uh, just a note is diffusion is uh, a fancy word for the movement of stuff down some concentration gradient. Advection is the movement of coffee solubles as a result of the moving water. This is analogous to erosion in a riverbed in which sediment is picked up and carried by the river and planted somewhere else as a result of the moving water in the same way that these coffee solubles are moved as a result of the water flowing through the bed. So let's get into diffusion and advection. We can model this by none other than the advection diffusion equation. Right here we have our diffusion term, right here we have our advection term. Note that anytime you see little c, that denotes a concentration of some type. We, all of our big Ds are our diffusion coefficients. All of our, uh, well actually, this will go away soon, but this is our liquid flow and then another concentration. We will solve for our liquid flow with something known as the Navier-Stokes equation, which is a fancy application of Newton's second law, uh, force equals mass times acceleration, but for fluids. This is actually a very complex equation, uh, so we will digress from that for now. Now, we need to describe the transport of solubles from the interior of the coffee grain right up to that coffee grain water interface. And to do that, we're gonna use, um, it has been shown in previous research that we can model this with the diffusion equation. And so right here, we have our diffusion coefficient, our concentration gradient. Um, this operator uh, just describes this, uh, describes a point in space as a source or a sink, and, um, really, for all practical purposes, you can ignore that. All of our diffusion, <clears throat> or base fact is we can model our uh, water flow as something called laminar flow. Um, that is to say that we can essentially say all of our liquid flow goes straight down, and with it goes all of our coffee solubles. So we do not need to concern ourselves with any water flowing this way, any water flowing this way, any backwards flow, it's gonna go straight down, which is gonna turn our differential equations into something much simpler. And that's what all of these equations say. I will spare you the details unless you're interested at the end. 
Now we need to consider the transport of coffee across that coffee surface. Now this is not an intuitive thing, um, but when you go from one phase, such as a solid coffee grain, into a completely different chemical environment, such as water, we need to describe that chemically. We can do this from two perspectives. First, we can sit inside the grain and watch everything go out into the water, and that's given by a diffusion <coughs> equation, equals some rate g, anytime you see big g, that's a rate. We can also go sit outside the water and see the same thing happening, but this time because we're in the water, we have to describe it with an advection diffusion equation, which we see here. Now I wanna point out that both of these are the same rate. So if we open that door and people started walking in, let's say 10 people per minute, we would sit in here and say, that's 10 people per minute. Well, if you stood outside the room, there's still, there's still 10 people per minute walking in this door, but we're looking at it from a different perspective. And so for that reason, we can say it's the same rate. <laughs> So how do we find the equation for this rate? That's a great question. We need to consider three cases in which the rate is equal to zero. <clears throat> and we need to consider these cases because anything that causes our rate to be zero must be included in our final rate law. So firstly, oh. firstly, <clears throat> consider the case in which there is nothing in the coffee grain. You cannot move nothing. So. Uh, that will contribute to our rate law. Second, we need to consider in which the number of coffee solubles inside the grain is equal to the number of coffee solubles outside the grain. They are in equilibrium. Remember earlier how I said you needed a concentration gradient? Well, now we no longer have one. No more, no more movement. Lastly, consider the case in which all of the water immediately surrounding the coffee particle is carrying as many coffee solubles as it can. It can dissolve in nothing else. Therefore, the coffee, so <clears throat> the coffee solubles cannot move into the water. And so here we have our rate law that describes the transport of stuff from the coffee going into the water. And we have our rate, big G, equal to some rate constant, which will be experimentally determined, and I will discuss later, times three concentrations. And then a small note on pre-infusion is there's, there is some small fraction of time over which water uh, <clears throat> saturates the coffee bed and during which there is transport occurring. However, because this is such a small fraction of time compared to the overall espresso brewing um, method, we're just going to ignore it and say that at time equals zero, there is nothing in the water and that the entire coffee bed has been saturated. So, <clears throat> we just described a rate at which the amount of stuff that moves into the water per unit area. Um, <clears throat> and so, now we need to ask, well, how much area is there? So. Uh, the authors employed something known as laser diffraction, which basically says smaller particles diffract light more, <clears throat> and with that we get our particle size distribution over the range of grind sizes. And then we can apply our formulas for the surface area of spheres and the volume of spheres to determine our particle surface area distribution and our particle volume distribution. And then we can multiply by our initial starting mass of coffee to get a total absolute surface area for all of our coffee. One problem. We assumed our particles were spheres. What if coffee is porous? This is a non-obvious answer, and for that reason, we need to find another way to test it. <clears throat> and so the authors use something called nitrogen physisorption to calculate this. Nitrogen physisorption, as it turns out, when you go to really, really low temperatures, around negative 200 degrees Celsius, will contact and adsorb onto a solid surface, and the number of nitrogen molecules that adsorb onto that surface is directly proportional to the amount of surface area present. So we employ this, and then we can calculate our total absolute surface area based on this completely independent method. Now, if this value and this value match, then we know the coffee is not porous. But if this is much, much greater, or even, um, uh, or, or just significantly greater than that, then we know there is some other surface area we are not accounting for. However, they do match, coffee is not porous. So earlier I said we have fines and we have boulders. We are going to denote all of the surface area of the fines as bet one and all of the surface area of the boulders as bet two. We're going to multiply it by our, by our rate because remember, it's some rate. Uh, <clears throat> it is, the rate is the movement of stuff per unit area times all of our unit, all of our area units, gets us the total transport of coffee solubles. Now, this slide has so much math, I don't want to concern anyone with it, and if you're curious, you can ask me to return to the slide later, but just note that we had our advection diffusion equation, and now we're gonna add that total transport of coffee solubles onto the equation, and then um, I would like to highlight that <clears throat> we can essentially say, so 
diffusive forces, the movement of copy solubles as a result of diffusion are so much slower than the movement of copy solubles as a result of the flowing water that we can essentially say it's zero. And so we will plug this equation into this reaction advection diffusion equation. And then from this, it follows by some, uh, this is a major pillar in our mathematical bridge to get to our uh, final model equation, but I will spare us the math details because this is a, an emphasis in chemistry to say that our extraction yield is equal to um, this event, uh, this ultimately amounts to some flow rate times the total concentration of solubles in our liquid at the end of our shot divided by our starting mass of coffee. So tuning the model to espresso extraction, we need to calculate how long, or no, no, not calculate. We need to determine experimentally how long it takes to brew our shot of espresso over a range of grind sizes. From there, and uh, so just, to, just to orient us to this graph, at small grind sizes, you have smaller coffee grains, uh, smaller boulders, and a larger number of fines. At larger grind sizes, you have larger boulders and a fewer number of fines. And we'll then plug that into a whole bunch of equations that you can ask me about the, at the end if you're curious. And then we can now effectively alter any variable we want and see how it predicts extraction yield. Before we look at the predictions, we, we need to <clears throat> recall that we had some coefficients that needed experimentally determined. Uh, namely, the movement of soft coffee solubles from the interior of the grain to that part, uh, coffee grain water interface. We had this diffusion coefficient. We matched it, to, uh, we fit it to our data, and we found this was our diffusion coefficient. You can just look at that and gawk. That's all there is to do. <laughs> Second, we need to describe the transport of coffee solubles from inside the coffee grain out into the water. We had this rate constant. All little k's are rate constants. In fact, there's really only one in this paper, so anyway. Then we fit it to the data, and here is the rate constant we got. Lastly, I just want to remind us all that I said that once we get the coffee solubles out into the liquid, the amount of diffusion compared to the amount of water flow, diffusion is much, much less than the water flow in moving those coffee solubles, and this is just a reminder. So what did it predict? So as we increased the amount of, uh, as we increased the starting mass of coffee, we saw a decrease in extraction yield. So we had 16 grams starting coffee all the way down to 24 grams, and we see extraction yield gets less and less, which that's an intuitive observation because extraction yield and starting uh, an initial mass of coffee were inversely proportional by definition. Then uh, as we increase our pressure, we also decrease our extraction yield, but this is a much less obvious fact. As we increase our pressure, we are going to increase our water flow, which means we're gonna decrease the time over which our coffee bed is exposed to water, and therefore there are less opportunities for the coffee solubles to get out into the water. Also, is I want you to imagine for a second, you're trying to get out of this room. Now, imagine that you're trying to push the door open, ignore for a second that it's a pull door, but pretend you're trying to push it open, and there's someone on the other side applying pressure so that you can't get out. Well, if they start pushing harder or applying more pressure, it is gonna be harder for you to get out of this room in the same way that the coffee solubles are gonna have more trouble getting out to the water because the water's pushing them back. And so for both of those reasons, extraction yield is inversely proportional. So what really happened? Well, it was, <clears throat> so what the authors did is they used something called a coffee refractometer, which measures the refractive index of your espresso beverage, and it correlates your refractive index to the total number of coffee solubles in your espresso beverage. They can then divide by your starting <clears throat> mass of coffee and get an extraction yield. So that's what they did. And what did they see? Well, um, we see, this was our prediction graph. We can take both of these lines, overlap them, and we see that at coarser grind settings, our model is pretty freaking good. But as soon as you get to some critical grind size, we get a decrease in extraction yield even though our model predicts it should continue increasing. Why is that? Uh, so the authors postulate that as a result of coffee clumping, um, the total or the effective surface area of the coffee grains decreases. So imagine you have 100 coffee particles. They clump together, and instead of the water saturating all 100 coffee particles, it's only gonna touch the outside of that giant clump. Um, one thing that they did not test is the Weiss distribution technique in which you declump the coffee. Um, but that is future research. So now what? You're going to have your barista buy a coffee refractometer, and they're going to determine <laughs> the extraction yield over a range of grind settings. 
And then you have your barista determine, tasty point, signified by this yellow dot. And they are going to, um, from there, determine the grind setting at which you have maximum extraction. From there, you are then going to have them decrease their shot volume, really just kind of play with this variable until you get an extraction yield that is identical to the tasty point, but is still at that critical grind size. Um, yes, I thought I had another point, but I'll, I'll digress from there. <clears throat> uh, alternatively, you can have your barista uh, do the same thing, calculate your extraction yields over the range of grind settings, and then have them decrease their initial starting coffee mass by 25%. Um, for example, we're gonna work with starting mass was 20 grams initially, now we're gonna put in 15 grams instead of 20, and then you are going to find the spot in the new range or the new extraction yield curve as a function of grind size until you get to an extraction yield that is identical to the original tasty point you determined. Um, now this, is, this, can, this can be confusing, but I just want to emphasize that you have this blue line, this is 15 grams in, and you have this, this black line, that's 20 grams in. You want to find the point on this blue line that is equal in extraction yield to the black line. Um, all assuming that extraction yields of identical values give similar flavors, which may or may not be a good assumption, but uh, that's not what we're doing here. And at this point, I'm sorry, we are out of time. Oh, okay. Well, there's the implementation. We had a conclusion, we pretty much saw it all. I would like to thank Dr. Mason, Dr. Black, all of my professors, all of my bosses, mentors, and what I consider now family at Pro Young for everything they've done for me. And uh, most certainly, I would like to thank my friends and family for all of their sacrifices and encouragement for me during my time in college. Um, here are my references. Do you have any questions? Yes. All right, does anybody have any questions? Dr. Vanderheim. Uh, in your big chunk of equations,